Cambridge Unit Society and thank you for coming along tonight. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Ian McKellen, an Oscar-nominated actor known for his outstanding contribution to film and theatre. He's played the lead roles of Macbeth and King Lear and has become internationally known for his, his role in the X-Men franchise and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Tomorrow starts a uh, month the start of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender History Month, which takes place every year in February. It celebrates the lives and achievements of the LGBT community. So Ian McKellen is a patron of History Month, a prominent advocate of LGBT rights and was a founding member of Stonewall. He'll be speaking today about his acting and his activism, so please put your hands together for Sir Ian McKellen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I am a, a f um, life member of the Cambridge Union, and uh, I joined when I came up uh, in 1958, and it cost me £8. <laughs> Uh, but I've not really been back very much since, or indeed at the time, I, I got so involved in acting at Cambridge that my ideas of debating came pretty well to nothing. Um, look, I, 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 I've got opinions on lots of things, like, like you have, and, uh, but I don't talk much about the fact that I'm a vegetarian or a, a pacifist, and I, I usually vote Labour, and uh, I'm fed up with the government, and... Uh, <laughs> I don't like student fees and all that sort of thing, but, uh, and uh, I like walking in the Lake District and uh, all sorts of things. But, you know, my views on these are, are of no more consequence than anybody else's, really. But I, there, there are two aspects of my life on which I'm an expert, and I feel like I do uh, have some right to speak. Uh, one is as an actor. I've been doing that professionally now for, for 50 years this year. And uh, then as a gay man, well, I suppose I've been gay as long as I've been alive, so that gives me some uh, qualification. And uh, <laughs> I, I propose to talk a little bit about both, and, and then if you've got any questions or discussions that you want to initiate, uh, we could while away the evening very happily, I hope. Um, I was brought up in, in, in the um, industrial south of Lancashire, uh, just post-war, and um, lived in a town eventually called Bolton, which had three theatres, three professional theatres, unbelievable these days, two of them designed by Frank Matram, the great uh, English architect uh, of, of provincial theatres, and uh, in, in one of the theatres there was a weekly repertory company, which meant they did a different play every week, and had been doing for 27 years. Uh, that means that they opened a play on Monday night, and then uh, the next night, the next morning rather, they, they, they blocked uh, Act 1 of the next play they were going to do, and they, they arranged their positions on the stage. Then that evening they would do two performances of the current play, and on Wednesday they would go in for rehearsal and they would do block Act 2, and then on Thursday Act 3. And on Thursday they'd run, uh, Friday they'd run through the play, and uh, they'd have Saturday off because there'd be three shows on Saturday, and... Uh, then on Sunday they'd learn the lines probably for the next show and uh, on Monday they would open it. Uh, and they'd been doing that for 27 years, which is why all the plays they did and all the productions were absolutely dreadful. And, uh, and people went along rather to see how the actors were coping, you know, trying to remember their lines and so on. There was another theatre that did touring ballet and opera and uh, a, a fancy pantomime every year. And, and next door to that there was the Grand Theatre, my favourite, which was a, a variety theatre. They, they put on different shows each week, of sometimes quite famous people who I'd heard of uh, topping the bill, but the, the comedians and dancers and singers and acrobats and animal acts and contortionists occasional uh, strip tease and I was allowed to go backstage because my father knew the man who owned the theatre and, and that was it, that was, that's what hooked me really at 13, 14 I was backstage meeting professional performers and wondering wh wh where the divide came between the misery of their lives really, you know, touring around northern towns doing two shows a, a night living in dreadful digs and probably not being paid very much and certainly having a, a wretched dressing room backstage and then stepping across the divide as it were uh, into the light uh, and there was the audience uh, and uh, bringing uh, some joy 
to the, to, to the audience's lives manufactured out of what? Uh, there was nothing in their own lives that, that, that you wanted to really know about, but there was some magic going on, and it was to do with some stepping from the dark into the light. And they had a secret that I wanted to discover, really, uh, and which is why I became an actor. I wanted to know how it was done. It being, I suppose, the magic that, that, that can happen uh, and in a theatre and perhaps nowhere else where strangers are joined together in the dark to listen to a story being told and the actors are in charge. Uh, thrilling stuff for me as a schoolboy and I did a lot of acting at school and um, no intention of becoming a professional because I knew I wasn't good enough. I, I'd seen all the great actors of our time at Stratford-upon-Avon and, and on tour. Didn't come to London very much. And, uh, but it was only at Cambridge uh, as a member of the ADC and latterly uh, president of the Marlowe Society. I don't know how I managed that, but I did. Uh, and just working in 21 different productions with, with, with people like myself who were dotty about the theatre, and many of whom had decided they would become professionals, like Trevor Nunn, who went on to run the Royal Shakespeare Company in the National Theatre and direct Cats. Like Corin Redgrave, whose father was the great Sir Michael Redgrave, and who came, brought his uh, sister up to, to, to meet me one uh, term, uh, Vanessa Redgrave, and we walked, walked along the backs together. Uh, Derek Jacobi. Ah, oh, Derek. <laughs> oh, the red hair and all fluffed up at the front and uh, very, very tight trousers and standing very straight. I was madly in love with Derek. <laughs> And he told me in an off moment that he'd been madly in love with me and we did nothing about it. But he now denies it to the press and I don't think that's fair, but anyway. <laughs> Not a lot going on in the sex line. Uh, and, uh, but just to complete my story as an actor, uh, once I'd realised that they were all going to get involved in the theatre, and, and, and others too, I thought, well, I suppose I can as well. And... Uh, Without going to drama school, I applied to one of these regional companies, uh, like the one I'd known in Bolton, but th these were doing plays, rehearsing plays for two weeks rather than one, and, and, and were therefore at least twice as good. And that, that's how I started my um, apprenticeship as a, as a professional, and did that for three years. And uh, so it went on and on and on. And one of the ways it went on, of course, was that, that my luck, I, it, acting is all about luck, really. I mean, success as an actor is about luck. I, I don't think you can create it or make it or anticipate it, but you can sort of prepare for it. And just be on your toes, just be, keep getting better or trying to get better so that when the moment comes, whatever it is, that is, that is going to give you the chance that seems that suddenly you are overnight you, you've become a success, uh, is, is backed up with an awful lot of preparation and that's what I spent uh, time doing it uh, uh, in those regional companies outside London. But it was a Cambridge friend, uh, Richard Cottrell, who, who recommended me to a Cam uh, an Oxford producer, Michael Codden, who put me into my first play in the West End. When uh, I, I went up to St. Catharines, um, my uh, supervisor, uh, an Anglo-Irish uh, brigadier, Han CBE, uh, uh, at my interview, he said, I, I, I see you are an actor. And I said, well, yes, I, I've been doing a bit you know, at school. Yes, what, 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 what have you played? I said, uh, Henry V, so that was the last thing. And he was clearly so bored out of his skull, you know, in, in, interviewing poor old grammar school boys with impenetrable northern accents who, <laughs> from his point of view, really shouldn't have been in Cambridge at all. But anyway, here I was, and uh, yeah, with a good recommendation from the head teacher, so he said, well, uh, do me a speech. So I, I stood on his, uh, put down his South African sherry, which he'd given me, and, uh, and even a cigarette he gave me to put me at my ease. Oh, how things have changed. <laughs> and I put them both down and stood on the chair and said, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, right through to the end. And he gave me an exhibition, uh, <laughs> which he took away after a year because I hadn't been working hard enough. <laughs> But he said, I, I hope you're not going to be like uh, Peter, you know, uh, Peter didn't work hard. Peter, Peter, who's Peter? Oh, Peter Hall. Peter Hall, oh yes, he uh, just gone to start the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford. 
He then went on to be the director of the National Theatre when he took over from Laurence Olivier, the great actor who started the National Theatre. Uh, when Peter Hall took over, it was the sign that the directors had arrived and the actor-manager had uh, met uh, his demise. But the point, my point I'm getting around to making is that Peter Hall read English at Cambridge University and he was succeeded at the National Theatre by um, Richard Eyre, uh, who read English uh, at Cambridge University. And when uh, Richard left there, uh, they got Trevor Nunn in, who read English at Cambridge, and uh, <laughs> after him we've got Nicholas Heitner who did the same thing. So, in fact, the National Theatre has been run by the same person, uh, <laughs> all disguised and with different names, but with the similar background, and I was lucky to be known by them all, do you see? I was a safe pair of hands, you could trust me, I knew my Shakespeare, I, I knew all about end stopping, and I knew about iambic pentameter, I'd learned it all at the ADC, I'd learned it all through Georgia Islands who used to um, teach English here. I'd sat at the foot of F.R. Leavis and uh, heard what he thought about actors. Those, um, you know, I could be trusted. So it's not that there's a Cambridge or an Oxford Mafia, but it's, uh, <laughs> it looks very like one. Um, <laughs> And I suppose that applies in other disciplines too, and I suppose it's not a very good thing, really. I certainly don't approve of a cabinet full of uh, old Etonians, but we won't get on to that. Um, about the time I was discovering theatre, I suppose I was discovering sex, or sexuality, at least. You know, uh, my, my friends were beginning to fancy girls and, and carry, pass around mucky books under the desk with, you know, boobs and stuff. <laughs> And there was casual chat about what I'd do if I could get her behind the bicycle shed, I'll tell you. <laughs> All of 13 and 14, these kids. And, uh, and I was puzzled because, frankly, I was more attracted to the boys than I was to the girls. It was as simple as that. And it wasn't something you could easily say, and I never did say it. I, uh, I went through school uh, just knowing that I was different and uh, I couldn't really put a name to it. Gay had not been invented, you know. That gay wasn't a word we used about ourselves. We didn't use any word about ourselves. We hadn't begun to identify ourselves. We, we were identified by what other people thought about us. We were queer. Queer. What a horrible word, queer. You don't have to think all your life that you're different because you're odd, because you're not working properly because you're peculiar, you're queer, that's horrible. Oh, but that's the word. Uh, and even that wasn't used much. Total silence when it came to homosexuality when I was growing up. No mention of it at school. My best friend was gay. I didn't realise it. David Hargreaves, I've just spent the, had tea with him. He still lives in Cambridge with his boyfriend. He's my age. He was gay. Uh, he turned out to be a professor of education at Cambridge University. Oh, he did frightfully well. We went around with our arms around each other in the school playgrounds doing high kicks when we'd seen musicals. And it. <laughs> I think we may have fiddled around in the, in the gym one day, but I... We, we didn't get round to talking about it or defining ourselves or understanding what turned out to be the case, that we were gay. So we were little queer boys who didn't dare uh, talk about it, that's the point. And uh, nothing at school, no mention of sexuality, no mention of sex actually. My, my only sex uh, education uh, happened uh, in one sentence when I was leaving, uh, we were called into the headmaster's office and uh, about 12 of us, and he said, well, gentlemen, you're about to leave this place. I've just got something I, I want to say to you, that out there you very likely will meet a certain sort of woman. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> well, I'm still waiting to meet her. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she's here tonight, but I... <laughs> It would be wonderful. I don't know what he was talking about. I think he was talking about safer sex, probably, but he couldn't get round to saying condom, French letters, we called them. Um, so that was it. And if I'd wanted to talk about myself or what was going on inside me and, and what I was going to do about that and, uh, and uh, how I would identify myself, I, I couldn't talk about it at home. I couldn't talk about it at Sunday school. And you couldn't read about it. There was, nothing, there was no literature in the school library. 
There was nobody famous who was queer. Well, a few dead people, but uh, not live. Nobody, nobody in politics, nobody in show business. They were there, they were gay, but they were not openly gay. I mean, my, my heroes, John Gielgud and, and Noel Card, uh, Michael Redgrave, Corinne's father, Annie Guinness, plenty of them, but uh, I didn't know. So a dreadful way to, a dreadful way to be brought up. Dreadful. And the whole reason was that it was illegal to be gay. <laughs> it makes you laugh, doesn't it? Illegal. Against the law to be gay. That seems to me like pointing at a cannabis plant that God has put in the hedgerow and saying, that will be illegal. <laughs> and what was illegal was that, that you could not make love. And I know people I know. John Dexter, the great, uh, great uh, stage director, the man who brought uh, Equus to the stage initially in the Royal Hunt of the Sun, in prison for making love. It's uh, dreadful. Still true, of course. I think, is it 37 countries in Africa that uh, were to be gay is illegal? I'm going to India next week. On Wednesday, I was told, shut up about it because it's not legal in India. They're trying to decriminalise it. Decriminalise it. That's what 1.5 billion people. How many gay men and women must there be there? All breaking the law. And it's no fun, frankly, having making love, knowing you're breaking the law. It's horrible. And it was my case uh, until I was 28 years old. So one of the reasons I became an actor was because I'd heard you can meet gay people in the British theatre, so it proved. I, um, and, and why is that? Because when you're putting on a play, as an actor, you're going to have to open yourself up in rehearsal, you're going to have to be honest, you're going to have to root around inside yourself, dealing with emotions that perhaps you didn't know were there, or perhaps you didn't, wouldn't normally talk about or want people to know about, but you have to do it because you're trying to become Hamlet. And you can only do that in the company of people who uh, respect you for that and uh, befriend you for that and love you for that. So why we call each other darling in the theatre the whole time. It, it, we are our darlings, we, but we, can't, we couldn't do it unless we were. So in that situation, you know, to be different is fine. To be overweight is fine. To be a Jew is fine. To be gay, terrific. Uh, and so I, I lived openly with, with, with the man. My first boyfriend of, of stature, uh, I mean, of long standing, was a, a, also from Bolton, an English teacher at a comprehensive school in Notting Hill. And we lived very happily and very openly. I mean, we went out together all the time as a couple. Didn't hold hands, you wouldn't take it that far. But uh, yeah, we had gay friends, straight friends. Everybody knew at work. My employers and my employees knew I was gay. I didn't feel the need to talk about it, I, you know, and didn't. I, I, gay rights passed me by, I didn't really know what was the problem. Well, I was being utterly selfish, I was uh, just getting on with enjoying myself and, 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 uh, and getting on with having a career uh, and uh, not understanding that uh, uh, there was a way in which I belonged to the world that I was ignoring, actually. So the odd situation came that, that I was 49 years old before I actually came out of the closet. Now what does that mean? The closet is a cupboard, of course, and, and if you, once you call it that, you begin to see what it's like. Someone who's not honest about their sexuality is living in the cupboard. You know, where, where there are things that you've grown out of and forgotten about, and the, the, there, are, there are cobwebs and skeletons perhaps better to get out of a cupboard and fling the doors open but of course you can't really do that with the closet um, you can't run up a flag in your front garden and say Ian McKellen is gay and that's it because it isn't it uh, it's, it's, not, it's not it until everybody in the world knows or, or there's nobody you mind in the world knowing that's what that, it's a journey to get towards that um, and um, I had a little bit of an extra journey that most people don't have to bother with, and that, that, that's to talk to the media about it, because I do interviews, and they say, uh, are you married, are you getting married, have you got a girlfriend, you know, have you got children, all that sort of thing. And I dodge around those questions. Uh, and uh, then came a time to 
to be open about it because the government, uh, this is uh, Margaret Thatcher, her government, uh, was passing a nasty little law called Section 28. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's affected all your lives, those of you who were educated here in a state school, because uh, it was a law by a centralising government wanting to stop a local authority, uh, who are in charge of state schools, uh, to talk, uh, uh, speak positively about homosexuality in the classroom. They felt that was promoting homosexuality encouraging children to become gay or think like gay people or not understand that a gay relationship is, a, a, in the words of the bill, a pretended family relationship. Uh, there must be nothing said positively in a classroom which would deter students from the, the view of, of the authorities that, that uh, gay people were second class citizens. And I took against that and uh, debated it on radio and in the course of it uh, came out and said I was gay. Now just before that program was broadcast I'd got time to complete the other side of my coming out which was talking to my family about it because I'd never mentioned it to them. 49 years old. Now my mother died of breast cancer when I was 12 and my father in a car crash when I was 24 and the greatest regret of my life I never told them. I never gave our family the chance to see what would have happened. But they were good evangelical Christians, they loved me and they'd have flung their arms around me I'm sure. But I was denied that. But here I am at 49 but I can tell my stepmother, she's still around, uh, and my sister and, and others and I drive up to the Lake District where she, Gladys lived, 80 years old. And I'm already getting a bit nervous. How am I going to tell her? What am I going to say? How am I going to in introduce the topic, which I've been avoiding for far too long? And I decide to drive her out to my favourite view in the lakes overlooking um, the Langdale Pikes. And I stop the car, and it's, it's a little one, and I'm beginning to sweat. It's steamy up, and I drive, pull the windows down. So I've got something important to tell you, Gladys. Oh, yes, what's that? There? Well, I've just been to San Francisco. Yes, I know. I've got your card. Thank you very much. Yes. And, and I, I met uh, Armistead Mop in there, a wonderful writer. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And, and uh, he, he's gay. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, well, I met other gay people there, and we, we talked about this and that. Oh, dear, and, and, and I'm really getting really. I'm 49 years old, and I, I, I can't tell my 80 year old stepmother that I'm gay. And finally, I said, So you see, Gladys, what I'm trying to tell you is that I'm gay. And she said, Oh, Ian, I thought you were trying to tell me something really important. I've known that for. I've known that for 30 years, so, um, <laughs> so we'd wasted 30 years of our lives. And thank God in that moment we came together. G gay people don't destroy families, they can bring them together. <laughs> and we were, we were best friends for the next 20 years, I was very lucky, she lived till she was 100. But interestingly she said, uh, are you going to tell your sister? Sister Jean, five years older, the girl who'd taken me to see Macbeth on Twelfth Night when I was eight years old, you know, uh, big sister. She said, I don't know how Jean's going to take it. Well, I went to find out and Jean said, oh, that's fine Ian. I mean, I've got plenty of gay friends and, and I've always longed to talk to you about it. And thank you. You're not going to tell your Auntie Dorothy, are you? <laughs> so everybody's always worried about somebody else. And I go to see Auntie Dorothy, she's fine. But then she said, you're not going to tell Stephen, are you? Your, your nephew. And hmm, I don't know how he'll take it. I, I go and see Stephen and he says, oh, that's fine, Uncle, but I'm awfully glad you didn't tell me two years ago when I was still at school. I don't know what the boys at school would have thought about me having an openly gay uncle. There's, uh, gays don't have a problem. It's everybody else who has a problem with us, it seems. And when I'd been that little round, and when I realised, oh, I see, I'm not in the cupboard anymore. Where am I? I'm in the real world. There was a weight that fell from my shoulders that uh, allowed me to stand tall and, and, and be myself. And what greater gift could an actor discover than to be confident? Or a person for that matter. Self-confident. And my friends tell me I became an act, better actor almost overnight. Well, of course I did. I was bothering about real emotions now. There wasn't a block. Uh, 
making me go into disguise. And of course acting is not about disguise, it's not about putting on things that, uh, other than yourself, it's, it's about revelation, it's about speaking the truth. So, it all fitted in. Uh, and uh, to such an extent that I mean, when I die, I wouldn't mind it saying on my gravestone, here lies Gandalf. <laughs> He came out. <laughs> well, there are plenty of people of my age who are not out, you know. Plenty of people all over the place are not out. There's hardly an openly gay actor in Hollywood. <coughs> Why is that? Because they're worried about somebody else. They're worried about what the audience will think. They're getting bad advice from their agents who may themselves be gay, but think that the world should go on being as it always has been. Why is there not a single soccer player professionally in this country who's got the bravery to say that he's gay? There they go around, being macho all the time, you know, they can do things that no other men in the world can do and don't they know it? They're, they lead with their genitalia <laughs> and they're frightened to say, oh, and I'm gay. I think they're advised by their, by their managers and by their uh, people who run these teams that they, 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 uh, the terraces won't stand for it. It's probably what they used to tell black football players. There's a Welsh rugby player come out, Gareth Thomas. He's coming to talk to you here, isn't he? Gareth Thomas, six foot five, all man. <laughs> I, I, I went to his coming out party and congratulated him. He said, Yeah, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I said, I knew you'd say that. We all say that, and it's true. I said, But better than 30 caps for Wales? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's what it feels like. He's in his early 40s. So, I've been going around schools recently and. Uh, talking to kids who are coming out of the age of 12, you know, 13 and 14. Uh, and it, for them, it's a changed world utterly, and they can't understand why people of my age have got a problem, which is why I go and exp try and explain it to them. And I also say to their straight friends, look, if ever anyone comes out to you at school, don't hesitate. Shake their hand, give them a hug, and say thank you. What a gift! Uh, what an honour to receive that, that that honesty. It's the only thing about being gay, which, if it works, uh, is a little bit superior to being straight. Because if you're straight, you don't have to do any of this. You don't have to worry about it. <coughs> got a girlfriend? Got a boyfriend? Yes, yes. You know, very early age, you can say. It. The wedding ring, the engagement ring, the family photographs, all that. Uh, I also tell the kids, uh, would you watch your language? Because, uh, I don't know if it's true when you're at school, but currently, the word gay doesn't mean homosexual anymore. It means stupid. It means not working. It means unfashionable. It means, it means queer, really. You know, this watch is not working out, oh, this gay watch, or my football team's gay, or that TV comedian, oh, he's so gay. And I say, look, if you say that and I'm around, I think, oh, is that what you think of me? Is that what you think? Oh, that's what you think of all gay people. They don't work properly. There's, there's something wrong with them. And uh, bad language can lead to bad behaviour, I suppose. I don't think it's right that uh, religious leaders should so easily sound off about uh, sexuality and be so condemnatory, because the link between their cruel and uh, strongly cruel words and action I don't think is too far distant. Else how to explain uh, the situation in uh, um, St. Martin in the Fields, uh, Trafalgar Square, uh, last October, 
a year last October when there was a man of 53 and he was celebrating the fact he just landed a job. He'd been out of work for a long time and uh, he was out with his uh, male partner and enjoying themselves. It was 11 o'clock at night, it was quite busy around there and they bumped into three kids, uh, three teenagers, two girls and a boy and, and um, who started mocking them, sending them up, making rude remarks about gay people. There was an argy-bargy and there was a bit of a shoving and a bit of a elbowing and s suddenly there was a kneeing and uh, they got the 53 year old down on the ground and one of the girls stamped on his head. And then she did it again until she'd killed him because she didn't like the fact he was gay because he didn't work properly. He was queer. What do you do with people like that? In our, in our capital city, 11 o'clock at night, with a lot of people there, uh, old prejudices dying very, very hard, and the victim dying hard too. They hang people in Iran for being gay. Last year, two 16-year-olds were strung up in a public place. They didn't actually hang them, they strangled them with the steel horses that were pulled up by uh, cranes. They televised it. That'll teach them. So, uh, the world is so far distant for, for me, uh, living in this wonderful country, uh, from what it used to be. But I'm aware now uh, of what happens beyond. And uh, uh, the focus of my attention is, is, is sometimes there, or at least to alert us to the possibility that things may not always be as good as they are now. Uh, they can slip one way. Uh, or the other. Ask me any questions and I'll answer them. My mother, well, well, what's the point of acting? Is it just self-indulgence? Or, or, or do you think you're doing some good? That'd be roughly it. My, my, my mother, I was told, uh, had said about my and liking acting, oh, she wouldn't mind me becoming an actor because actors give so much pleasure. Well, I've held on to that. I know we do. And intense pleasure. I know, because I have it myself when I see a film or watch a television or, or go to the theatre. I, I can't stop going to the theatre, always hoping, don't you, Geoffrey, that it's going to be good this time. <laughs> and uh, So, uh, I tend to be involved in plays that I think are going to bring that about, if we're talking about theatre. And my first judgement is, of a script, is this something I would like to see? Before I ask, is this something that I think I can play? But, uh, it's, of course, it's not just the... Um, entertainment that you give, it, it's the satisfaction that you get and uh, uh, therefore the, uh, uh, an early requirement of a part would be it, it, it's something that I'm not certain that I can bring off and, and, and certainly isn't a, pl a part that I feel I've already played somewhere else. Um, because in, in, in trying uh, something that you are uncertain about you're, you're perhaps going to um, if, well, if certainly if you bring it off, then the satisfaction's enormous. It's a very personal thing, because it may, you may never have talked about it to anybody else. Yes? Um, is it right you were born in Burnley? I was born in Burnley, yes. Oh, were you? Lovely. What? Lovely. Oh, never mind, darling. <laughs> <you'll know. laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, no, I don't go back much because I don't have any family there and uh, that would be the main reason for going, wouldn't it? But 
Yeah, I, I do feel myself to be a northerner. I had my accent taken out a bit. You, you, you kept held on to yours, and, and quite right too. Uh, but, but when I was starting out, the idea that you could play a Hamlet with a Lancashire accent was just... <laughs> or Richard II, or any of these other parts that I wanted, or Romeo. I, and so I, lear I learned how to get away with it. And also, th there were so many s snobs at this place, you know. The, they come from their wretched little independent schools and they, they laughed at me because I couldn't say one. One was what I said. One, two, three. Oh, this one. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so I, I got rid of my Lancashire accent as, 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 as much as I could. Uh, of late, it's began to, begun to creep back. And uh, I don't mind that, really. I think, I think that's proper. Because I think an accent is absolutely in your DNA. I don't know how it gets there, but it is. And you can't really get rid of it. Well, you have to work very, 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 very hard. And what's the point? So these days, drama schools, they say, no, cool, keep, keep your accent, keep your accent. Learn how to do other accents. And I think that's the better way of doing it. Yeah. Why are you a vegetarian? <coughs> Sorry, why are you a vegetarian? <laughs> that's what I said I wouldn't talk about. Well, I... I <laughs> I saw a corpse one day, and it was an animal corpse, and uh, I, I lived by the river, and it was on the beach, and, and uh, I, I got obsessed with l looking at it from afar, and uh, when it had been washed away, I couldn't eat anything for 24 hours, and then effortlessly, I stopped eating meat, with the exception of bacon, <laughs> and the occasional pork pie, yes. Do you know, I don't know. <laughs> I work very hard at it, is the answer. And, uh, um, but as in that sketch you're referring to, I suppose, uh, the, the, there's a lot of nonsense talked about acting. And uh, um, I don't think there are many actors could tell you how they do it. Uh, nor would they make the distinction between their own acting as being <coughs> better than anybody else's. It, it's... Uh, uh, there's a lot of technique that, that, that you pick up. I've learned how to get a laugh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, and it's usually a matter of waiting, like that. Uh, but uh, timing, you know, you can, something you can learn. There are things about acting you can learn. But uh, there's other things you can't learn. And it, it's, it's sort of letting the audience in, I suppose. And you do that by letting yourself out. Is, is that... It's why I hate microphones. I mean, these are in a recording, I think. I don't think they're helping me be heard. And I hate uh, theatres with, with microphones because we're, we're, uh, we're involved together. And how can we be involved if there's something in the way? And, and what it gets in the way of is the... the air being pushed up from the diaphragm, this great muscle that you may not be aware of except when you laugh. <laughs> oh, it's moving. <laughs> or when you cry. <laughs> oh, it's moving. <laughs> so the emotions are nothing to do with the heart, notionally. Nothing to do with the head, they're to do with the muscle, where they start. And that's where it all starts, and that's where the breath starts. And you push the breath up through the diaphragm, and it goes through the lungs and up here, and then it gets in the mouth, and it, 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 it touches all those most intimate parts of the body, you know, the, the love-making <laughs> tongue and the teeth and the lips and the, the saliva and past it goes the teeth. It can be measured going across the air and it lands in your ear. So your ear is connected to my diaphragm. <laughs> we don't want these getting in the way. And it's, uh, it's, the connection with a, an audience is like that emotionally as well, I think. Yes? Sir Ian McKellen, may I call you Gandalf, first of all? What would you say if I told you you were a little bit late? Well, that's the second attempt to get me to quote, uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I will before the, the end of the evening, no doubt. 
Yes. Yeah. When you're approaching work that's an adaptation, like for instance, Lord of the Rings, do you approach it with some trepidation? Because obviously it has such a wide reach, and you know, every single person's strength has got this idea of the character in their mind. So do you focus on your interpretation of the character or the author's interpretation? How do you approach it? Uh, the, the problems of adapting uh, a well loved classic for another medium. Well, <laughs> I kept telling those people who knew The Hobbit so well, uh, the, sorry, the Lord of the Rings so well, uh, look, it's not your Lord of the Rings, it's Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. But he's a clever uh, fellow, and uh, he based much of the film visually on uh, the familiar uh, paintings and drawings but that uh, the readers had seen interleaved with the reading edition, the books, the books, the novels, Alan Lee, one of them, and, and uh, John Howe, the image of Gandalf uh, that they drew was the one that I, we matched me to. Because the first description of Gandalf is that he has uh, uh, eyebrows which grew beyond the brim of his very wide hat. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, no one's going to take that character, seriously, on film. <laughs> uh, so you go back to the John Howe portrait of, of Gandalf and you, and, and you match that uh, and, and you're rewarded by everyone who's ever read the book saying, you're exactly as I imagined him. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm exactly as John Howe imagined him. Uh, so. But, uh, you know, I had the book in my... Uh, you can sometimes see uh, the... I've got the big paperback edition of the three novels. It's in my it's in my Gandalf's gown in case I needed to refer to it and say Peter Jackson. It says here, no. uh, we've got the line wrong or something, or there's something more we can put into it. It'll be easier with the Hobbit, which I start filming on the 21st of February in New Zealand. Uh, that uh, because that's a little slim volume that can uh, <laughs> top away more easily. Have you spent decades? Basis now knows you as Magneto and Gandalf. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, I should worry. I mean, it's, um, if you're best known for the work which has been seen by the most number of people, is it surprising? Uh, all I had to make sure was that the films I were in, the plays I was in, whoever saw them, it was going to be the best work that I could possibly do. Uh, and uh, the rest is up to fate. But I know uh, Alec Guinness uh, regretted all the rest of his life that he'd played in Star Wars, or, or rather was known as the actor in Star Wars. Yeah, but I play Gandalf. Did I have negative experience when I came out? Well, yeah. Uh, um, death threats. We know where you live. There's a bullet with your name on it. Usually quoting the Bible, I have to say. Always anonymous. Often in green ink. Go to the police. They say, well, we've seen dozens of these before. Don't worry about that. But you do, sort of, don't you? Uh, <laughs> And actors do keep putting themselves up in very vulnerable positions on brightly lit places where the crowd are in the dark. And you think, <laughs> <laughs> rather relieved tonight to see that we're all equally lit. Well, um... <laughs> but I, it was too late, you see. I was 49, I was already established. So, I mean, and me and McCullum was understood. He was a commodity, if you like. He was a brand. Oh, he's gay too. Oh, oh. Well, that's rather interesting, maybe, that he... Improves the situation. <laughs> and and so it was subsequent to coming out that I became successful in films. That's what you're told can never happen. And then people say, yeah, but um, Gandalf isn't very sexy, is he? Well, well, therefore, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Gandalf the gay, you know. It's, uh... <laughs> well, and there were certainly a lot, lots on the internet saying it was wrong that a, that, uh, a faggot should play Gandalf. Oh, yes. But not much of late. <coughs> yeah. Um, which role has genuinely made you feel the most empowered and why? Which 
Ah, no, very interesting. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the gay rights activist in Uganda who was uh, found murdered uh, in his home uh, shortly after Rolling Stone, was that the name of the local publication, had printed the names of, of, of famous people in Uganda who were gay, I think giving their addresses and, and suggesting that the readers should hang them. Uh, this was the first victim that uh, we suspect has come as a result of those dreadful words. Uh, the police say, of course, it was, uh, it was just a robber who uh, had called and uh, killed his victim. Well, of course, in Africa, bless them, uh, some of them say, oh, it's not our problem, there are no gay people here. At least there weren't until the whitey came over and, and, and brought uh, homosexuality. Western disease with them. No, 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 no. There'd been gay people in Africa before the whites got there. Of course they have. It's, it's embedded in every culture, the, 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 the idea of, the, of the, either the non-sexual male or, or, or the male who, who's uh, separated out from women and, and has, but yet has a part to play within society. That's well established. Nothing to do with the white, uh, um, whites and blacks and Westerners and, and Africans. Uh, I mean, you do hear people saying the most astonishing thing, like, um, uh, whereas uh, uh, in uh, Iran, that there are, there are no gay people in Iran. I've heard someone say it about uh, whole swathes of Africa. I've heard people say it about public schools. Oh, we don't have any gays in our school. <laughs> well, they don't know about them. That's the point. So, I mean, what right do we have, what role do we have in, in, in trying to help brothers and sisters who, who are having an absolutely wretched time? Well, I suppose we do as much as we can and uh, bear witness, really. But, you know, for, if, if you were to stand up every time there is an injustice done against a gay person in the, in the world, I mean, you, that would be a full-time job, and it is, for, for, for Peter Tatch. I'm a big fan of his. He draws attention to things that otherwise uh, none of us would know about. Um, but it is an international uh, movement. Oh, Peter Tatchell. Um, there, there, was, there, was, there was a hero of, of the struggle against apartheid, a, a, a young black gay man called Simon Nkoli. And when he was on trial for his life, uh, he came out to his uh, colleagues in the ANC in prison, and they cut him off. They wouldn't talk to him, sent him to Coventry. Now it happened that he was found not guilty and released, and he became not a, a, an ANC activist, but a gay activist. Peter Tatchell, the English, sorry, Australian, uh, human rights uh, worker heard about this and went to tackle the ANC leaders who were living in the United Kingdom at the time this was before apartheid had been overthrown and explained to them the relationship between the struggle for the rights of black people in South Africa and, and, and the rights of gay people there too and the ANC understood it and accepted it uh, and that's why when, when uh, they took over the government, they proposed that there should be uh, in the constitution of, of the country, uh, it should be illegal to discriminate on grounds of sexuality. Peter, Peter Tatchell had done that, you see, interfering in someone else's internal affairs. Uh, and just to complete the story, because it brings me into it, I, I, I was raising funds for the committee who, who were trying to bring around this... Uh, uh, this um, part of the constitution uh, and uh, I was doing a show there and raising a bit of money and it was suggested by the producers that I go and uh, lobby uh, the president, Nelson Mandela I, I apparently could get an interview with him because I was a visiting actor so I went along with Simon and Coley uh, and uh, Pumzilium Tetwa a uh, lesbian uh, law student at uh, Wits University. And we, we, we picked up Simon from his house, and uh, uh, the, the, the others couldn't believe it. He was wearing a jacket. He, he'd never seen Simon in a jacket before. More, 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 he had a briefcase with him. 
no tie. I said, what's in the briefcase, uh, Simon? Oh, there's nothing in the briefcase. <laughs> so why have you got the briefcase? Well, I'm going to meet Madiba. I can't meet the president without a briefcase. <laughs> well, bless him, we were in a cab, and, and uh, we got out of the cab, and he'd forgotten the briefcase. He, he left it. <laughs> so Madiba never saw the briefcase. <laughs> But he saw the three of us and he let us into his little office in Johannesburg and, and uh, Simon, who was a chatterbox, couldn't speak. He, he was just so honoured. But eventually he said I, that he'd been on trial for his life and his only regret of being found not guilty was that he didn't get to serve on Robin Island. And uh, Mandela said, no, you don't wish that. What do you want to talk about? So we talked about gay issues and, and the rights of gay people and he said well we must in the new South Africa all be equal uh, please tell the world outside that you have my approval <coughs> so now it's in the constitution and uh, it mightn't have been there if it hadn't been for Peter Tatchell's the long winded point I'm making and uh, it is the only country in the world that has it in its constitution it's unique that you may not discriminate on grounds of sexuality. So, you know, out of those years of misery came uh, that duel, really. Uh, and uh, we have to be careful that Zuma is not going to renege on it. Yes? Um, do you struggle with harboring resentment to people who don't come out of the closet, as you can say, because you feel they are indirectly being offensive to you? I feel sorry for them. Because, as with uh, Gareth Thomas, the best thing I ever did in my life. I know that. Uh, but it has to dawn on them eventually. You can't, you can't go around telling them they've got a responsibility. And you don't. You're, the only person you've got a responsibility to is yourself. That's the first person you have to come out to. And once you've done that, well, you're on the way. Mm. Oh, one more question. All right. Well, who, who really, really, really wants to ask the question? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I think the two hands got it. Yeah, all right. Um, something I went down with question 10 with, but the two documents that most sanction the hatred um, against gays are the documents that found the two largest religions in the world, Christianity and Islam. Do you think that we will see widespread acceptance of <coughs> gays uh, as equals as long as religion, especially in the two major monotheisms, remain as powerful as they do today? Well, did you hear that? He's uh, suggesting that uh, <coughs> the Bible and, and the Quran have a lot to answer for uh, well Gladys uh, my eight year old stepmother who had no problem with my being gay was a Quaker she believed in the Bible but she believed in that part of the Bible which said that you should love your neighbour as yourself and that you should honour people she didn't look into the minutiae of Leviticus well, it makes it illegal, I th to think, to, to, to eat prawns, is it? <laughs> no, I think the people who point to the Bible to condemn homosexuality are, are being very partial. And they're probably the same sort of people who used to use the Bible to condone apartheid, or slavery, or the ill-treatment of women. It's all there in the Bible. Well... Then you have to start asking yourself, what is the Bible? Is it a law book? Well, in part. Is it a history? Well, in part. Is it fantasy? In part. Is it myth? Is it parable? Is it literature? Yes, it's literature. And I just wish all those Christians, particularly the ones who run the organisation, had read English at Cambridge. And it... <laughs> So 
I, I, if, I, if I'm faced with, 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 with a Muslim or a Jew or, or, or anyone claiming that they have their religion on their side, I say, please, it's an internal argument. Will you go and have it with another Muslim, with another Jew, with another Christian who doesn't agree with you? I'm sorry, I can't dis start disentangling your confusion. But, uh, you know, I, w I was on the march um, against the Pope. I mean, what would, I suppose he's welcome here, but, you know, not as a state visitor and, and not saying things that are hurtful to quite a lot of people. Uh, and I, I was all set to go and visit a, a Catholic school, uh, a state school which is um, run by Catholics, not funded by them, run by them. And uh, they said, as I've been spotted, as they said on, on, on the anti-papal march, uh, the, they would have to withdraw my invitation in case I was going to be rude about the Pope. <laughs> well, I worry about the people in that school. I worry about the teachers. Any gay ones they happen to have there? And I worry about the students. And I worry about the kids in that school whose parents may be gay in a civil partnership. They probably wouldn't have sent their kids to a Catholic school. <laughs> but, you know, the world has changed, that's the point. And, and uh, religions have, have got to uh, catch up with it. And I know the argument against it that our laws never change, but they're wrong. They do. Look, I'm just going to finish with a little bit of Shakespeare. And it, it's, it's a gift uh, to you, and, and it's precious to me. Because uh, it's a play that the RSC has subsequently done, but it didn't receive its first performance until I, I played the leading part. Uh, and it's called Sir Thomas More. We did it in, in Nottingham. And uh, so you're looking maybe at the last actor who will ever be able to say that he created a part by William Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, and uh, the play was written by Shakespeare and others. It's odd to think that Shakespeare uh, didn't necessarily write all of the plays in that conventional way of one author, but the, the, they used to write together, I suppose, rather like uh, people write together for TV these days. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the speech I'm going to do is in the British Museum, and it's in Shakespeare's handwriting, and it's the only example of a manuscript of his. That makes it uh, doubly precious. Uh, and the situation is uh, in uh, St. Martin in the Fields, you know, where that girl had her way. Uh, but it's back in the uh, 16th century, and uh, the crowd is complaining about the strangers uh, in their midst. And uh, usual complaint about strangers, immigrants, odd people, <coughs> queers. They, they behave differently from the rest of us and they look different and they eat odd food and take odd jobs, you know. Send them back home wherever they came from. Uh, get rid of them. Uh, stamp on their heads even. And Thomas More is sent out to put down the riot, which he does with um, uh, explaining the law and, and insisting that it should be obeyed. Uh, and also being by Shakespeare, he does it uh, with an appeal to uh, humanity which you might feel relevant to what we've been on about this evening. So um, someone says that the strangers should be removed and Thomas More says, well grant them removed and grant that this your noise hath chipped down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs with their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation. And that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silenced by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What had you got? I'll tell you, you had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought with self-same hand, self-reason and self-right, would shark on you. 
and men like ravenous fishes feed on one another. Oh, desperate as you are, wash your foul minds with tears, and those same hands that you like rebels lift against the peace, lift up for peace, and your unreverent knees make them your feet to kneel to be forgiven. You put down strangers, kill them. Cut their throats. And lead the majesty of law in Lyam to slip him like a hand. Say now the king as he is clement. If the offender mourn should so much come too short of your great trespasses but to banish you, whither would you go? What country by the nature of your error should give you harbour? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, Spain or Portugal, nay, anywhere that not adheres to England. Why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? Whet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if the God owned not, nor made not you, nor that the elements were not all appropriate to your comfort, but chartered unto them, what would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your montanish inhumanity